Um, it's great to be here. I'm just going to warn you in advance that my talk will be different than the last three talks because uh, I'm not with a huge company. I'm just here representing myself. I'm an artist. And uh, I do work with Google's Artist and Machine Intelligence Program, which I'll get to at the end. Um, but I'm not with Vibe or Facebook or Google, really. I'm just my, myself and uh, uh, independent researcher so, uh, an artist. So um, this talk's called Narrated Reality. And it's really about um, presenting an alternative to the options that exist right now in virtual and augmented reality that's enabled by uh, machine learning. So let's go ahead and get started. And I want to get started by playing a game. So has anyone seen me speak before and played this game with me? If you have, just keep your hand down. Don't give it away. Um, but uh, this game is called Actual English Word or Invented Gibberish. And let's start with this one. So, um, Vicaritate. Who thinks this is a real word? Raise your hand. Well, almost nobody. Who thinks this is a fake word? Raise your hand. Like everybody. You guys are right. This is fake. I can't believe you. Um, okay, so next one. Is pleboricol, consisting of leaves and plants of the pea family. A uh, real word. A couple people, about half the room. A okay, fake word? It's fake. Sorry. Um, okay, next one is tautology. A uh, real word? Like everybody. Yeah, I can't believe that's true. Um, and the last one is uh, logistics. Real? Nobody. Fake? Everybody. Yeah, it's fake. So you might be asking yourself now, was that the real definition of tautology? Um, and the answer is that it was not. This is the real definition of tautology. The, the definition I showed you said, The study of the development of moral principles in the mind and the opinions of the processes and the explicit processes of people. And even though we had etymology and everything like that, the real definition is, in fact, the saying of the same thing twice over in different words. Um, so where do these fake definitions come from? Well, they came from this Twitter bot I made called Lexiconjure. And uh, I made it by training a long short-term memory LSTM. I don't even need to explain what that is to people here, I think. Usually I have to go long, short-term memory. But LSTM recurrent neural network on the Oxford English Dictionary. And um, here, this is my favorite definition to came up with, which is the one for love. It's a result of a person's or animal's response to a problem or difficulty. She's an independent employee. So that's like the best definition it's come up with so far. You can usually tweet a word at it. It's not up right this second, but I'll turn it on right after my talk. I realized I forgot to turn it on this morning. Um, you'll be able to tweet a word at it, and it'll define it. Like I said, I won't do it right now, but it will in about a half an hour. So, um, when I made this bot, Twitter actually banned it briefly, and it gave me this really like, raw reaction, because in certain ways, while I recognize this is not human-level intelligence, it is like smarter than certain animals, right? I mean, it can take in a, uh, a string of letters that it's never seen before and parrot that back to you in the context of real words. And to me, that's sort of magical, and it felt like Twitter had killed my pet. And I was sort of left to grapple with this feeling that Twitter had killed my pet. And I wonder, you know, what is this? Is this the uncanny valley of language? Like, what version? Where am I right now? And where this all started is with this project Word.camera, uh, which is a web app that uh, expressively narrates uh, photographs using artificial neural nets. Um, it's really about redefining the photographic experience. So, as an artist, I, I put this inside of an old medium format film camera on a Raspberry Pi, um, and uh, you know, like I said, redefining the photographic experience. And I wanted people. The reason why I didn't put it into like a sleek metal box is because I wanted people to immediately understand this is a camera. And to communicate that, I thought using an antique film camera would be the right method. Um, so that's where it started, and, and the output looked like this. It printed out a like, receipt printer, like a Polaroid. And um, you know, uh, it was a little choppy, but what, what I did to kind of account for that was I gave the poems epitaphs, uh, which were uh, paragraphs from books that were algorithmically matched to generate the text. So you ended up with something that seemed uh, coherent and then also related to the image that you captured. Um, and then in December 2015, so that was April 2015, in December 2015 I started training my own neural nets on NYU's high performance computing facility. Um, long short term memory recurrent neural networks, the one right here. This is Char RNN by Andre Karpathy. And, uh, 
image captioning models like this one. This is um, a neural talk to also by Kyle Battery. And I started playing with these, uh, this code that he had put up on GitHub and also Justin Johnson's code that was mentioned earlier later on. And I really discovered that these algorithms have you know, magical qualities when you compare them to something like Markov chain or context-free grammar. Uh, because I started generating poetry and uh, some of the early poetry I generated looked like this. Um, and like, this is not quite a human level poem, but, it's, but it is coherent and it does conjure imagery. And to me, uh, that was powerful, so I kept going. Um, and, um, you know, just to be clear, when you generate something with an LSTM, you have to see it with something, so you have to give it something to start with, and then it predicts the next letter or space or piece of punctuation, does that over and over again to generate text. So um, I, I started looking for different ways to sort of manipulate that process. And the first way, the simplest way I discovered was just to seed my poetic language LSTM with an image caption. And as a result, I got stuff like this. Um, it says, the man is sitting at the edge of the waters. I should see him begin to stand at the throat of the graveyard. Um, and it sort of goes on like that. It becomes very abstract um, after a few lines. Um, but I, I made this into a device that I actually wore around New York for a while. And um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's got a camera on the strap, a computer in the, this bag. And then there's also a GPS unit and uh, a clock. So it's narrating my experience um, using imagery, time, and location. Uh, and it prints out these receipts. And this was um, 2016. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I developed this further um, with some advice from Ty Yu Choi, who's the director of the School for Poetic Computation in New York, into a project called Camera Compass Clock. Um, so I decided to take that one device I made, that one really quick prototype and messenger bag, and split it into three devices, um, a camera to narrate imagery, a compass to narrate location, and a clock to narrate time. So um, they all had the same guts, these NVIDIA Jetson system on chip uh, computers, and this Datamax O'Neill Micro Flash 4D thermal printer, which is the kind that police officers <laughs> use to print traffic tickets. Um, so I trained a, a big library of these LSTM recurrent neural network models on different things. I had to put them on, on SD cards in order to use them interchangeably with the set of devices that I created. So here we've got like tech news, sci-fi prose, uh, sci-fi screenplays, hip hop, uh, film chat, which is just continuous movie dialogue, which I'll get to in a little bit, uh, folk music lyrics, uh, presidential candidates, and Robot God was just covered religious text in the mind. Um, so uh, can, can we play this video? This will sort of show how they all work, all these devices in this series, camera comes off work. So um, you have the clock. Um, so first you start by selecting a model from that library of neural network models on those SD cards. You pick one. Um, and then uh, you take that SD card and you put it into the device's SD card slot, just like a video game cartridge. Um, and then there's a brief user interaction. In this case, she's punching in. And then the machine narrates, in this case, the time. Uh, this is an antique punch clock built in 1915 about uh, by the predecessor to IBM actually, which I found very interesting, um, which I guess started out making punch clocks at the turn of the century. Um, and so what this looks like, um, we go to the next slide, sorry, it seems to be frozen. Maybe just click outside the, the video for me. That was still unable to do it. There we go. Okay. So it says the time was two minutes past midnight. The corridor was a long corridor into shadows. And the whole thing was the same as a wall. And the door slanted from the line of the wall. The sun was a dead wave of appearance. The moon had been dimpled, and a corner of the corner was silent. And the floor was like the sable pile of a flower. A cold road would be stronger. So to me, like, somehow the midnightness of the first line has trickled down through the rest of the text. And that's really interesting. Um, and so that sort of encouraged me to keep going with this. And 
the, the, the camera um, is, is, is like the camera he saw before in the original concert of 2015, now uh, updated in 2016 uh, with better algorithms. Um, so uh, you get stuff like this. This is with the full music model in the camera. And this is a picture of me standing in front of the clock. <laughs> so we've got many things at play here. Um, but you can see it sort of looks like folk music, and if I, if you weren't a, a writing expert or a folk music expert, you might think this was written by a person. Um, and I'm not saying that it's human level, but I think the implication is clear that it could be very soon. Um, so uh, the last one is a driving kit called the Compass, and uh, that's a compass from a B-17 flying fortress. Um, and uh, it's on, mounted on the center console from a Crown Victoria police car. And inside is the same computer printer that you saw on the other models. But this is designed to go in your car so that you can write with your car. Um, and uh, you get stuff like this. Um, this is an NYUITP parked up in front of there. I was where I went to graduate school. Um, <laughs> So uh, that's what one of the film dialogue models um, gets a little racy sometimes. Um, and uh, here's all three together at my thesis show last year. So where have I gone from here? Well, like I said, when you train a model on continuous dialogue, you can actually ask the model questions. This is one of my favorite responses I ever got out of one of those dialogue models, which is, where did you grow up? I didn't have to do that. That's um, trained on the Cornell Movie Scripts Corpus, which is a big corpus of movie scripts. And what I did was I just ripped out all the dialogue and trained some continuous lines of dialogue. And so when you seed with one line, you get the response or a plausible response. Um, and so I used a model like that to make this movie called Sunspring with Thomas Middleditch and Oscar Sharp. And this is one of my favorite scenes from the film where Thomas Middleditch vomits out an eyeball because we didn't just generate the dialogue, we also generated the action descriptions. <laughs> so um, this, the line of the screenplay here is he pulls his eye from his mouth. And that's what he did, so it's just wonderful. Um, and then, I like this scene better though. The line is he pulls the camera toward his back, which is just an incredible line in general. But then the angle changes angle changes and he's holding nothing. And to me, that scene really illustrates the creative possibilities inherent in these machines. Uh, because in this scene, we have a machine direction. He pulls the camera toward his back. He is on the phone. And then a human interpretation of him holding nothing. And that's really powerful um, in the sense that that human interpretation was informed by years of film production experience. And they're sort of having a dialogue with the machine, in a sense. Um, so that film came out last year. You can watch it on YouTube. It's called Sunspring. We've been very successful with it. It's been a wonderful ride so far. More recently, um, I've been working on a project where I wore a lavalier mic, similar to the one that I'm wearing right now. Um, this one right here, not the one I'm holding, um, for two months straight, all day. Um, and uh, between November and January, between November of last year and January of this year. And what I'm doing now is I have all this audio, two months of audio, and I'm training an LSTM on the transcripts of that audio, which I had made using CMU's Pocket Space library. And then I'm going to make a bot that talks like me forever <laughs> uh, in the form of a mannequin that will whisper in my voice, ideally. Uh, forever. And then in the grant proposal that I made uh, provides for adding a new mannequin every two to nine years when the technology improves. So um, it'll eventually be a, a circle of mannequins dressed in my clothes all talking like me forever. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm very excited about that. The other thing I'm really excited about right now is happening tomorrow. Um, tomorrow I am going on a road trip uh, for Google's Artists and Machine Intelligence Program. And on this road trip, um, I will be doing something very special with a car. I will be adding one of these Axis M3007 uh, pan tilt zoom surveillance cameras on the hood. I will be putting a microphone inside the car, and I will be having a GPS sensor on the roof. 
And together, those sensors with my neural nets are going to narrate our journey. We're going to write with our car. And uh, it'll be sort of like automatic on the road. Uh, and we're driving from New York to New Orleans in two days. <laughs> and uh, like I said, it's happening tomorrow morning. Um, so I'm very excited about that. And I'm, I'm especially excited because we're going down to New Orleans. We're going down to Biloxi, Mississippi on the way to New Orleans to meet this gentleman, uh, Josh Sniffen who has a YouTube channel that I encourage you to check out called Not to Concentrate. Now, Josh is like a self-described redneck um, who builds gaming PCs, really nice ones, custom gaming PCs for rich people, and he uses GPUs. And so I asked Josh, hey, um, I found him on YouTube, first of all, because I was looking for somebody to help me with this project. And I asked Josh, hey, can you help me mount a gaming PC inside of an antique large format camera so that I can make the next version of Word camera? So he did. And it looks like this. Um, this is an 1890 E&HT Anthony Imperial Climax Studio 8x10. And inside of it is a GTX 1060, uh, Intel i3, and uh, just a full you know, mini ITX motherboard um, that's mounted right behind the lens hole. So in front of the lens hole is going to go a digital camera. And behind the, uh, on, behind the computer is going to go a thermal printer that will print out uh, the narrations in real time. What we really have is like, you know, a, a, a true, uh, you know, kind of all the components will be hidden on the inside, like the fan, um, and it'll be a true image to text camera prototype um, that handles all computation locally, uh, like the most recent version uh, that I showed you, uh, but can also use uh, actually the dense cap algorithm that um, was shown earlier by Justin Johnson, along in conjunction with uh, the neural that I trained myself. Um, so uh, I'm really excited about this project. It's going to be um, shown at a gallery in New York called Rubber Factory in probably as early as September, but possibly as late as January. We're still working on the details of the show. But I'm hoping to have three to five of these prototypes on display for sale. Um, if you can afford one, please get in touch with me. Um, and uh, yeah, we're also going to have a, a lot of related, a body of related work, uh, including. Um, that's sort of going to be um, on the theme of early photography and innovation in early photography, because I feel like that's what's really very relevant here. It's about <laughs> redefining the photographic experience with machine learning. So um, that's all I've got. Uh, thank you very much. I think I have like two minutes left if there's questions. Have you thought of adapting uh, your camera stuff for the blind? Uh, I have. Um, and I do see the cameras as assistive, as assistive devices. However, I think there are a lot of very serious researchers who are working on that right now. And I see my role as being more of a playful one. And I'm trying to get sort of the public at large, people outside this room who maybe don't know about machine learning, to think about AI and what AI can be used for and kind of to broaden their horizons in terms of what these technologies are possible, what these technologies are capable of. Yeah, the front. So I love the idea of you know, compositional film, especially with AI. Uh, where do you kind of see that going? Not just writing the script, but actually composing film pieces together, cut, cutting scenes together. Yeah, so so Oscar Sharp, who's my director, film director, who I work with on Sun Spring, um, he wants to see every role on the set replaced by AI because what he thinks is that when you replace a role with AI, we're not really replacing it. We're actually just giving everyone who deals with that role a lot more creative control. And the, and, and the other thing is that when we replace a role, we understand that role so much better than we do. And a lot of roles on a film set are very ill-defined, um, at least as far as the general public understands them, especially something like the director. Like, what does the director do? I still have no idea. Um, Oscar, I think, has no idea, actually. And he's like one of the best directors in the world. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a really open question what a director does, right? And an AI, which is a decision-making machine, you know, the director makes decisions. Um, it's totally plausible that, yeah, we could see other roles in the film set being augmented with this technology. Um, so, thank you very much.